Welcome to the latest edition of the CORE podcast series. Tonight we're here to bring you another Town Council update from its February 12th meeting uh, and also give you some information about some future events to look forward to on the, uh, on the approaching horizons, uh, including a future public forum that we intend to host. And we also want to bring you some new breaking news uh, that was part of the Town Council meeting uh, from this last week. I'm joined once again by Jerry Powers. Good to have you, Jerry. Thanks. Uh, so tell us about the meeting that happened on Wednesday. Well, um, it, one of the most important things that happened at the meeting was um, the mayor got served with a lawsuit to remove him from office based on a couple of things. One is a violation of the nepotism ordinance where he appointed his cousin uh, for, and she served for, I think, two and a half or three years without him ever disclosing that she was a blood relative and not not eligible to hold public office by his appointment. The other, uh, the other count in there, one of the other counts is misuse of public funds, which we've been talking about the sewer and improving using public funds to run sewer onto Bassett property. So that's one of, one of the other counts, which is not allowed by the state constitution and is not allowed by several statutes, the Governmental Conduct Act and several others. Well, as usual, the town's agenda for the meeting, which was posted 72 hours in advance, or the Friday before, um, was somewhat nondescript. It didn't look like there was going to be much that was taking place at the meeting, but this news about the recent lawsuit that's been served on the mayor is one of the reasons why we'd encourage uh, residents uh, of Edgewood to come to local town meetings mm -hmm. and to, at minimum, watch our podcast series to be able to participate in the governmental uh, process as well as to become informed about things that are not widely publicized or noticed. Certainly from the agenda, uh, I don't think anybody would have known what was coming uh, yeah. at this meeting. Yeah, and I want to say I realize everybody's got families and jobs and that sort of thing, so I really appreciate the fact that people have taken time to come to these meetings. It's made a difference already. The, the town has changed their behavior substantially. We're not completely there yet. But, and there's a lot more to do, but I have seen significant improvements in uh, the attitude. It's, there's less hostility toward public input. There, is, there has been uh, changes in the way that the agendas are now being performed, which is basically, that, that's another one of our successes. Yet another success we've had is we, uh, one of our members, uh, Karen Kaiser, complained to the Attorney General's office about the town violating the Open Meetings Act. Now, why is that important? Because we should have a bottom-up government where the people are listened to, and the more you shut down public input or public dissent, you lose the uh, overall effect of making the best decision from many different perspectives. One person on that council cannot understand how it's, uh, an ordinance or a resolution is going to affect every different category of person who lives here, both economically, age, uh, demographics. It's, so I really appreciate people coming and staying tuned. We've, we've kind of let out information that we were going to do something like this lawsuit, but uh, we couldn't really come out with it entirely until we had it filed and, and served. So that's going to be uh, something that is going to be ongoing. Well, just to follow up on the Open Meetings Act complaint, uh, the Open Meetings Act has a statutory purpose that says in order to have an informed electorate, the citizens of the state need to be provided with the most amount of information possible about the business that the government is conducting. To further this legislative objective, the Open Meetings Act provides that any action taken by a local government needs to be done in an open meeting. And then it lists some uh, ex exceptions where the local government can close the meeting if they want to talk about certain items that are identified in the statute for which you can have a closed meeting. The issue with the closed meeting the town has been having is that they have not identified what topics of conversation they're going to discuss in the closed meeting, which prevents the public from participating because we don't know what you're talking about. Um, so in this open meetings co complaint that uh, Karen Kaiser filed, she suggested that the town was not complying with the law because they weren't giving any specificity for the agenda items for which they were closing the meeting. And she got a determination letter from the Attorney General's office that said what, Jerry? Well, basically, I'm just reading the conclusion here. It says, because we have identified what appears to be a consistent pattern 
of deficient specificity in agendas and motions to close meetings, we strongly recommend that the Council take better care to satisfy the OMA's requirements. In the interest of providing the public with access to the greatest possible information regarding the affairs of government. So they agreed with us and why and again that's important because if there if if the town is left to its own devices, it gets in, it exists in an ivory tower and they don't understand the impacts of what they're doing. Or in this case, we've seen that some other kind of agenda seems to be playing itself out when the other two councillors have voted with the mayor to do things the town does not want to do. They came out vehemently against residential sewer extensions where you mandatorily have to hook up, cost $17,000. The, take, the takeover of EPCOR is extremely unpopular. And without specifying in the agenda that they're going into closed session to discuss EPCOR, we have no idea what's happened to it. So it was a, it was a great thing uh, that the Attorney General did agree with us and instructed the town to correct those errors. Another thing that we saw was the operation of the change in the town's operating ordinance, mm -hmm. which kind of rolled into this meeting on Wednesday, mm -hmm. where previously the town had limited public comment to two minutes and was seeking to constrict the amount of public participation as well as participation by the town councilors going forward through a very, very strict operating resolution, mm -hmm. uh, which was defeated essentially and amended that's right. Through the efforts of Councillor Sherry Abraham to allow greater public participation. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the first person to actually exercise this increased public participation was Cheryl Huppins. And, and it's really ironic because she's using that and then at the same time she's arguing against it. She, she's against it while she's using that facility to express herself. So here you see that, now this is the same Cheryl Hupperts that was the uh, first cousin of the mayor that was appointed that created this whole nepotism problem. So, and here she is arguing uh, for a more restrictive, limited input in, in public matters. And it's just really, I can't even believe that kind of thing is happening, that somebody would argue against having more input while she's taking the benefits of the of more benefits that we work so hard with the public's help. That part of the scrutiny that, that the public has exerted allowed us to have an influence on the uh, change in the operating resolution to allow more openness. So we're certainly grateful for the change. We find it ironic how <laughs> you know it, the, this change was first brought into practice. Democracy can be messy, but that's the form of government that we have here in this constitutional republic, mm -hmm. and. It's one where minority views are not suppressed, but these people are given a voice, mm -hmm. and we find that through this process, it's the greatest opportunity to cultivate ideas, mm -hmm. to change hearts and minds, and to come to consensus about what the public really wants. Yeah, and it's the only way you can have a bottom-up government like the Founding Fathers envisioned. Otherwise, if the public ha doesn't have the information they need, and they, don't, they can't make the in input that they need to make to influence uh, the politicians to do the right thing, then you've got a top-down hierarchy which is alienated from the general public and can won't make the best decisions for the people. Well, during public comment, uh, there was a local resident whose name is Sabina Price, mm -hmm. and she made a presentation to the council. Uh, you want to tell the, the uh, our viewers what the presentation was about? Yeah, essentially, uh, Sabina handed out copies to the counselors, uh, photocopies of the lawsuit that, that we had filed, and she served one on the mayor uh, personally because the town got one on Monday. He needed to be served personally. And then her comments were essentially, you've taken an oath of office to enforce uh, these ordinances, and you're not enforcing the nepotism ordinance. You let this happen on your watch. And even after finding out about it, and Cheryl Huppert's resigned, they did not move to enforce uh, the removal of the mayor, because that is the penalty for him violating the nepotism ordinance willfully, was to uh, remove him from office. So she was basically calling, calling them out on that and saying, it's your job to do that, and you're not doing your job. And who are the plaintiffs on this lawsuit? Uh, it's Howard Calkins, our former mayor, and myself, and uh, Tom McGill, who's one of the founding members of CORE. And can you explain why it is you felt compelled to be a part of this process? 
Well, uh, I was actually skeptical when I joined CORE. I just wanted to come to the meetings and listen to what was going on. And some of it was unbelievable. And it's only because I, you know, I was able to see the evidence that I realized that some of these things are actually happening. So um, the Attorney General moves very slowly, uh, if at all, and there is a lot of corruption in New Mexico that goes unnoticed and swept under the rug, and that's how these things can, can happen. But thankfully, the statutes allow for an individual, when the AG is not doing it, to be able to press the case and, and uh, remove a public official for corruption. So in answer to your question, that's how we are able to do it. How, why I wanted to, I, I'm a firm believer in bottom-up democracy and not wasting taxpayer money or benefiting from public funds. I mean, that, that's one of the, the oldest rules in the book is you can't feather your own nest with public funds. Uh, I also noticed that, you know, in our legacy meeting in November 14th last year, we had that uh, handout that the mayor was giving of his platforms. He's gone 180 degrees against all of that. So he told us what we wanted to hear. And then he did what he wanted to do, which was completely the opposite of what we were told. That kind of thing uh, it should be offensive to everybody. It certainly is to me. And that's the impression that we got from that legacy public forum back in November of 2019, was that the citizens could not believe the information that we were telling them. That's right. They were offended by what they heard, and they wanted to know what they could do about it. Yeah, I remember at the end of the meeting, it was the, the tone was, what do we need to do to get this guy out of office now? Now, as a matter of fact, one of the one of the things that incensed everybody so much was the idea that our election should be held next month in March for these for these municipal seats, including the mayor. And they found a loophole and managed to extend their terms, which we think is unconstitutional, but it, it would have to be challenged, uh, and extended it for two years. So there again, the the right of censure if you don't like the way things are going in your town is to vote them out of office. But when they extend their term another two years, that right has been taken away from us. So we're going to have another meeting at Legacy Church on March 12th. And one of the things that is going to happen there, it's going to be a huge effort, uh, is to, there's a way in New Mexico to force a special election, which will cause every one of them to have to rerun for office. And that would happen in the November election cycle. So this is a way for us to get accountability for what has been happening and the fact that they haven't been listening to us, they've been doing their own agenda, and this is our way to say no. We don't like it, we don't want it, and we're not going to have it. So I really want everybody to mark uh, March 12th on your calendar. It's going to be a great meeting. We're going to present a lot more information about all the progress w that we have made, and we want you to sign a petition which is required by law to create this new form of government, which will give us a lot more accountability and input, but also cause everybody to have to run in November. Uh, that's our way to say, no, we're not going to have you arbitrarily extend your terms. Now, the form of government that the town of Edgewood has today is called the Mayor Council form of government. What we are proposing is that the town of Edgewood transition to the Commission Manager form of government. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the highlights that are differences between the two is that in the commission manager form of government, we would have five commissioners, all of equal standing. One of these commissioners would be voted on by the others to serve as the mayor in a ceremonial or official capacity. Um, but the mayor wouldn't be a strong man compared to a weak council that we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we like about this form of government is that it gives citizens additional rights, mm -hmm. including the right to recall elected officials, which currently can only be done for malfeasance in office. You've got to do something bad or evil. Yeah. Under the commission manager form of government, you have additional rights to re of recall that don't necessarily need to meet that threshold. That's right. I mean, if, if you don't like the way they're voting, like we, a lot of people have expressed uh, a strong displeasure with Councillor Abrams and, and Holly because they were voting lockstep with the mayor. Now that's changed just recently. Councillor Abrams had voted for this new operating, manu uh, operating resolution that allows for more openness. But when they were doing that, we, under this new form, we could have recalled either one of them because we don't like the way they're voting. We don't like the fact they're not listening. So this is another way to say, wake up, you got to listen to us. It helps keep our elected officials accountable to the people that they serve. Exactly. Another thing that we like about this form of government is that it also allows for 
uh, direct legislation, mm -hmm. uh, which includes initiatives. So if the citizens want to petition the town government to enact an ordinance, we can do that. We mm -hmm. can't do that now. Uh, and the other thing that it does is it provides for referendum, which is if the town enacts an ordinance that we, as the citizens, do not like, we can petition the town to have that ordinance rescinded. A yeah. great example would be the sewer ordinance. This thing doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's going to be horrible if it's ever implemented on the town. Mm -hmm. The cost to local residents could be cost prohibitive or could even bankrupt you or put you in such a hole that the town just forecloses on your property because you can't afford to connect. Yeah, that's a great example because everybody was so opposed to that and they came out in such force that the, the mayor and the council actually exempted a lot of people out of the mandatory hookup provision which doesn't make any sense because they're putting millions of dollars in the ground in this residential sewer, which coincidentally goes on his property, and then he doesn't care if anybody hooks up or whether it ever pays out or whether it even makes sense. So we could have, as you said, rescinded that that uh, sewer ordinance, and that would have stopped a lot of this in the, in the it, dead in its tracks. So again, I want to say it's going to take all of us to do this. This is a a major change in the form of government, much better than what we've got now. And it, in a small town, it's easy to get these little clicks where people exert too much influence and they try to benefit off of what's happening. With the commissioner-manager form, much, much harder for any one individual to run the agenda. And I think that's probably the most important aspect. And certainly another one is the fact that under the commission-manager form of government, we haven't talked about the manager portion, mm -hmm. is that uh, under this model, the town operations day-to-day -day are done by a professional right. who is capable and credentialed to do the work of managing the town. Right. Currently, that function presumably is done by either the mayor or the town clerk. It's one or the other who's right. essentially running this town day-to-day. -to -day. And, and if, I think if I understand it right, right now the mayor can fire the clerk. So that gives them, uh, in my opinion, way too much influence over the clerk in terms of the way the clerk runs the town and does the agenda. So this way the commission, the commission itself would have to vote to who, to who to hire and who to fire. Well, our goal has always been bringing transparency to local government, um, increasing the opportunities for citizen participation, mm -hmm. and it's our belief that the commission manager form of government creates greater citizen rights greater elected official responsibility mm -hmm. than does the mayor council form of government and that's part of the reason why we're advocating for it. The other reason that we're advocating for it, as you mentioned before Jerry, is to restore the rights of the citizens to be able to vote for the people that they want to represent them. That is the elective franchise that we should have had mm -hmm. in March of 2020 in about three weeks from today yeah. uh, that has been taken from us under this loophole in the Local Election Act in order to try to reconcile these election cycles to move them all to November. And essentially what it's done is it's robbed the public of their vote. So what's the practical effect of the government not listening and the, and the people not having the rights of recall and some of the things that we're talking about? Well, the practical aspect is EPCOR is still out there somewhere. We don't know where, when, when they're going to vote on it or what they're going to do. So that ha would have a t tremendously detrimental effect on the town. The other thing is nobody has ever put together a, a package and started building the trails that we've been promised forever out here. We live in a beautiful place where we could have access to all of the BLM land and government land around, have multi-use trails where the people can hike, they can bike, they can... Uh, ride their horses. Now that is something that's on the horizon because of the changes that we're making. It's another one of the beneficial effects of what we've been doing is that there are now some appropriations up that haven't been voted in yet, but at least they're on the table to build these remote uh, network of trails around Edgewood. So the practical benefits are we don't have to have our town water system taken over and have our bills go up two or three hundred percent. We can get the trails we've been promised. We can get paved roads. There hasn't been a, a road that there's been some repaving but not new road paved in the last three years. So th this has a real practical benefit to the people. It, it's the benefit of bottom-up government. And we hope to continue that uh, as we move forward in this calendar year, and obviously one of the big things that we're going to talk about at our public forum in March is going to be this litigation that we filed uh, to have the mayor removed. 
Yeah, so uh, I want to thank everybody. It's working, What, what the, you staying engaged, coming to the town meetings, coming to our legacy meetings, and, and just watching and being educated. They know that you're watching and it's making a difference. So uh, please mark, mark March 12th on the calendar. Come to our legacy meeting. We're going to have a lot more information, and we want your feedback as always. We want to see if you're on board with the commission manager form, if that's something that you want to do. You can sign a petition at the meeting. So please come, please give us your input, and thanks again for uh, participating. Absolutely, and one of the things that I want to leave you with in closing is that the efforts that we are taking require time, energy, and resources. And we have certainly put in to this effort everything that we are able in order to bring transparency and openness to local government here in Edgewood. And we would encourage you as we move forward in the future, if you're able, or willing to partner with us because you can certainly play a part in bringing openness and transparency to Edgewood and uh, we think that it's a worthy endeavor that is worth the time. Uh, we believe that it's worth the investment because the decisions that we make today and the actions that we take today are going to lay the groundwork for our future in this community. So we'd like to certainly thank you uh, for everything that you've done so far and, and encourage you to continue your participation. Thanks Adrian. So, this is Adrian Terry and Jerry Powers bringing you another uh, core podcast brought to you by Citizens for an Open and Responsible Edgewood. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.